Give us a sense what you're hearing from the hillside right now as it relates to Russia. There's obviously, we are in this for the long haul. The president said he's not going to back down from it. What are you hearing from those that you speak to on the Hill? Well, what Senator Menendez said is something that Democrats have been saying for nearly a week now since this decision by Saudi Arabia. Senator Menendez is obviously in a very powerful position as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, so what he says matters. But Democrats on Capitol Hill have been furious about this. We haven't heard as much from Republicans, but this is definitely also going to be an issue that Congress takes up when they come back in November. Obviously, we heard over the last several weeks, uh, President Biden said privately at a Democratic fundraiser that this is the closest we've been, Matt, to a nuclear Armageddon in 60 years, dating back to the Cuban Missile Crisis right now. Some Republicans have said that he's been too casual in the way that he's talking about this issue. Don't Republicans agree that the president has done one thing effectively, at least, which is unite the Western world against Russia? Yes, but I think also what they would caution is with the president of the United States and the leader of the free world and the largest nuclear arsenal is going to use the word Armageddon. That sends shockwaves. And so it ha that has to be backed up by a certain level of seriousness. I'm not saying it is, but that words matter, right? We all say that. So I think that is something that took a lot of people by surprise, including Republicans. And look, if this Putin continues to escalate this war, we're going to hear, be hearing a lot more about it, and Ukraine will be back in the news, where it hasn't been for a while. Uh, you guys stick with us for a second. I want to get to Steve Kornacki for a second, who's also joining us right now. Uh, Steve, thank you for being with us. Give us a sense to, to what you're hearing right now, and you're keeping a close eye, obviously, as it relates to the midterms that are coming up a short distance from now, just four weeks away, where Russia is, you know, is sort of waned in terms of the, what Americans are keeping a close eye on. Yeah, I mean, t t t a couple of ways of looking at it. I think, obviously, look, the stakes, I think we all know, a 50-50 Senate. Republicans just in, in need of a net gain of one seat to get the Senate. Republicans need a net gain of just five to take the House here. Typically, you'd look at the president's approval rating, and you'd say Republicans are well positioned to do both of those things. Joe Biden's average approval rating sitting at under 43 percent right now. If you look at the most recent presidents who've been in that territory, this point before their first midterm election, Donald Trump 2018, Barack Obama in 2010, go back to Bill Clinton in 94. All of them lost the House. All of them lost dozens and dozens of House seats. So by that sort of historical standard, this is a perilous place for Biden and his party to be. Where it gets a little bit more complicated right now, though, obviously, is this question of the generic ballot. When you ask folks, Democrats, Republicans, which one would you prefer to run Congress here? Typically, what we've seen is when a president has a very low approval rating, in those examples I just showed you there, the opposition party usually enjoys a substantial lead at this point in the generic ballot. But what we're seeing is the Republicans do have the lead, but it's less than one point. Right now, on average, it's 0 0.9 points. That's the Republican advantage on the generic ballot. That is an improvement for Republicans from where they were two or three weeks ago. If you went back into September, Democrats actually had a slight lead in the generic ballot. So there's been some slight movement towards Republicans here. Certainly, Republicans are hoping this would be a late developing wave, seen those uh, in the past a few times, 2014 comes to mind, where the Republican advantage didn't really explode until late in that campaign. So that's what Republicans are hoping for. But there is a bit of tension right now between the low job approval rating for Joe Biden right. and the st still very competitive generic ballot that we're seeing here. And it raises the question of, you know, we're always asking that, is something different this time than before? You know, Democrats hope that that looming presence of Donald Trump, the former president, may be creates a new dynamic in this midterm that just hasn't been there in past midterms. Yeah, Steve, thanks for breaking that down for us. I want to get back to our panel, if I can, on that very topic. And Sochi, let's get to you quickly for some of your reaction to this. Obviously, one of the challenges had been for the Democrats, whether it was going to be an issue of inflation and the economy or an issue of abortion that really sort of drove this conversation. Has the Dobbs effect, that is to say, has the Roe v. Wade decision now become sufficiently far out that it has waned in its importance for those independent-minded voters that haven't made up their minds yet? Well, I think it is because of the Roe decision. You do have a closer race. I think a few months ago we were looking at Democrats losing not only how the House but also the Senate. What Steve was talking about, the generic ballot, will likely impact what is happening on the House. I think you'll likely see that Democrats will lose the House. In the Senate, what's happening is each of those senators have high approval ratings, especially the ones where we're defending seats, have high approval ratings in those states, much higher than President Biden. And they are talking about issues like 
Roe v. Wade and abortion, and also the economy and what they've well, accomplished. Let me ask you on that issue of the economy. Obviously, yeah. that's been more in the headlines recently. Saudi Arabia thumbing its nose at President Biden. It means the potential for gas prices is to go back up again. Yeah. Obviously, the way gas prices go, strategists on both sides agree is often the way these elections go. Has Absolutely. that become a problematic issue in the waning weeks? Well, I think that the economy and gas prices rising does not help Democrats, right? And I do think that while you have people who have started voting and, you know, we're, we're a few weeks away from the election, right. the reality is, is what does turnout look like at the end of the day? Do we have enough people in our Democratic base that will turn out because of the road decision? And how does that impact and counter sort of independents who are, and others who are worried about gas prices? That's, and, and they should be worried about gas prices. What Democrats have to do is show that they're doing something about it. And that's why I think you have the administration who's a little nervous about Not it. Not how anxious are Republicans right now? Well, we're, we're always anxious. It's, 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 it's what, a month That's out. what the Democrats yeah. say. <laughs> but no. Look, I think the, the number Republicans look at, especially when I was at the NRCC in 2018, is the president's approval rating. 42, 43 percent. Unless your name is Manchin or Collins, you can't outrun a president of your own party in a midterm by seven or eight points. It's mm -hmm. just not done. Typically, folks in Congress and the House and Senate stay between a point or two when it comes to that approval rating. Leah, what are the party leaders on both sides thinking about as they sort of imagine control of Congress in the new Congress, in the, new, in the beginning of next year? Well, I guess everyone's waiting to see what that's going to look like and what that breakdown looks like. But they're making um, some plans already, certainly on the Republican side. They are breaking or making plans. And if you're a Republican, no one is jealous of Kevin McCarthy and the job that he is going to have next year if Republicans are in the majority. He has tried to keep his party together when they're in the minority, which is much easier to do. But he's going to have a lot more extreme members, most likely, who are elected. And he has to line that up with... Is it Kevin McCarthy's job? Is that a no-brainer? at this point? I, if he is Speaker of the House, yes. There is no one who is actively running against him. Yeah. People think it's going to be him. The question is, is he Speaker or is he a Minority Leader? Most people think he's going to be Speaker. Yeah, at this point, I think it appears to be the way things are going right now. I want to ask you about what we're watching take place in Georgia right now. Herschel Walker bringing in the heavyweights. He's got Tom Cotton, Rick Scott, obviously, who runs the Senate campaign committee for the Republicans right now. What struck me as I heard the reporters on the ground today, Matt, in Georgia was they'd ask about Herschel Walker and about these allegations, and they would, like a good politician does, immediately pivot, not even address it, just say, you know what I think about Raphael Warnock and the following. Herschel Walker, the challenge for him right now is he needs to make up ground, right? It's not enough just to get rid of this issue. He has to build some ground and make up some points in that tight race. Yeah, so the Republicans I've talked to with this, they expect a little bit of a dip in the polling, like they've seen with some of these attacks that have come in the past. But these attacks in the past have resulted also then in a bump to essentially equilibrium, a margin of error race. I think they're waiting to see whether or not this is a little bit more permanent or it's also a bump in the road. And let's remember, Warnock can't get above 50 percent. He's about 48 percent after spending a lot of money. So if this ends up, ends up in a runoff, a lot of what happens in other states like Georgia or Nevada, if the majority is at stake, that will play a lot into the runoff. I want to ask you about the John Fetterman conversation. I know we're pivoting. We're going around the, the horn, as they say, right now. John Fetterman, for the first time, inviting a reporter, NBC's Dasha Burns, to do an interview in person. He used closed captioning. Notably, that will be allowed in the debate that he uses, that he holds with Dr. Oz only a short time from now. Why? What was, the, what was the thinking behind this? Is it to sort of make voters more comfortable with this? And do you think it's effective? Well, that's absolutely right. Um, it's an incredible interview. And I think that what the Fetterman campaign is doing is they're trying to be transparent. He's been trying to be transparent from the beginning. That is what voters want to see. Well, he's trying, trying to be to... transparent now because he was starting to see some points get shed. Well, no? and, and we always knew that it, all of these races are going to get closer as you get closer to the election. And we know that. But with Fetterman, I think what's interesting is he's trying to tell people, listen, we've all had health issues in our families. We know someone either who's had a stroke or has had some health problems. And this is how I'm managing with I think it was smart to do the interview, especially if he's going to have to be in front of a debate. It's less of a distraction if this comes out a few you know, days ahead of a debate versus right as the first time they see him do this is at a debate. So from a communications perspective, I think it was well done. And he looked like a strong candidate, you know, and and moving forward, I think you want to see him sort of out there talking about the issues and this be less of a distraction. Two last thoughts, Matt. Uh, real quick, uh, if, this, if Mehmet Oz wins this race, it'll be on crime, though. They've been pummeling him on 
online crime ads about that. Health will get a lot of the ink. It's a real issue. But crime is the one that will win this race. For and I think you're right. James Carville, as we heard, right, the Democratic longtime strategist, saying if you guys are fighting on the issue of abortion, you're not doing enough here. You've got to be able to push back on issues like crime and the economy. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I was just talk I'm doing a story on Northeast Republicans right now in New England, and I'm hearing the exact same thing, that abortion is probably not going to resonate in, that, in those mm. states because there's already access to abortion there and that Democrats need to be focusing on the economy, too. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.